Hi everybody, we're going to start in your course pack on page 129 with male reproductive physiology. Before we get into the content there, I feel like we need to go back and hit some terms that you may have heard of in a previous course. We're going to talk about diploid and haploid. We're going to talk about chromosomes and chromatids, double-stranded or single-stranded chromosomes, which is basically a replicated versus a non-replicated chromosome. <clears throat> and then we'll talk about homologous chromosomes. So Maybe in a previous biology course, you've heard of these terms here, diploid and haploid, and this has to do with the number of chromosomes that are found in a cell. The only cells in the human body that are haploid, meaning having half the normal number of chromosomes, are sex cells, such as egg and sperm. So the haploid number in a human being is 23 chromosomes. That's because during fertilization, an egg with 23 chromosomes will join with the sperm with 23 chromosomes, giving us a diploid cell called a zygote. The rest of the cells in the human body are considered to be diploid. That means that we have pretty much everything else falling into the somatic cell category. And these cells all have 46 total chromosomes. So in other words, there's 23 pairs. So our diploid or somatic cells will carry uh, 23 pairs or 46 total chromosomes. You'll notice the N and 2N designations here. N simply means 23, and 2N means 2 times 23, or 46 total chromosomes. Take a moment to look at the pictures here. They've color-coded some of these chromosomes. The red ones are single here, and then they've got a pair of them in the diploid state. Same for every other color. So a diploid set of chromosomes is basically two sets of the chromosomes in, in the normal cells of the body. This is a chromosome and you'll notice it looks kind of like an X or some people say it looks like a butterfly. The chromosome that you're looking at has been replicated. That means that the top strand, this one here, has been copied perhaps over here. And each of these is now called a chromatid. In fact, because they're supposed to be identical, these two are called sister chromatids. Okay, so both of those are sister chromatids. You'll notice these two down below also look like they're fairly similar. They too are called sister chromatids. So they are the arms or legs, you might say, of a cell or of a chromosome rather that has been duplicated. So you're not going to expect to see sister chromatids when you have an unreplicated chromosome. Now, this is what we call a double-stranded chromosome or a replicated chromosome. The way I know it's replicated is because it has sister chromatids. A single-stranded chromosome or an unreplicated chromosome would simply have one chromatid on top, a centromere, and then one chromatid on the bottom. So this one has been replicated, meaning it has two chromatids on the top and two chromatids on the bottom. So here on the left, we have a, a single-stranded chromosome. On the right, this one's called a double-stranded chromosome, or you can simply call it a replicated chromosome. Now, we need to have this conversation because we're going to talk about separating the sister chromatids during mitosis or meiosis, and we have to have a replicated or double-stranded chromosome in order to do that. Let's go back to the concept of diploid and haploid for just a moment. I mentioned to you earlier that diploid cells have how many total chromosomes? The diploid cells have 46 total chromosomes. So that means that there's 23 pairs of chromosomes in our somatic cells. Those are our body cells. And you can see here that these are homologous chromosomes that have paired up. So Let's just pick a number. Let's say this is chromosome number six. These two have found each other. They have paired up, and when we go through mitosis, those sister chromatids from those homologous chromosomes will separate. So what we're looking at is a way for cells, or for new cells being produced, to have either the same number of chromosomes as the parent cell, which is the result of mitosis, or to have half the normal number of chromosomes that's the result of meiosis or meiosis. So let's talk more specifically about male sex cell production. We're going to do an overview of meiosis or meiosis 
we're going to talk about mitosis versus the uh, meiosis process, and then we'll talk specifically about spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis. You've probably talked about mitosis in Bio 210 or a previous biology course. Mitosis is somatic cell division. This is how cells divide in the body. It is a single division process that produces clones that are identical to the parent cell. So it's basically cell cloning. Now, the chromosome number remains the same as the parent cell. If you start with the parent cell with 46 chromosomes, then your goal is to produce a daughter cell with 46 chromosomes. So we're not reducing down the chromosome numbers when we do mitosis. However, when you do meiosis, we do expect to see a number of those chromosomes reduced. So meiosis is found only in sex cells. This is how we produce egg and sperm and no other cells of the body. These sex cells must undergo two divisions to produce genetically different cells. Now, the goal here is to reduce the chromosome number by half. If we start with 46, our goal is to reduce the chromosome count to 23. Ultimately, we will produce four cells, each of them with 20, 23 single-stranded chromosomes. That's why we must undergo two separate divisions during meiosis, because we're reducing the chromosome count and the number of chromatids through each division process. This picture just illustrates how homologous chromosomes pair together. Remember, there's 23 pairs of chromosomes, or 46 total. The 23 pairs find their homologue, or their twin, so to speak, and they then separate through meiosis one, and then those, those sister chromatids separate again through meiosis two. So what we end up with in each of these cells is 23 single-stranded chromosomes. So we do have a total of four cells that we make as a result of meiosis. Notice with mitosis over here on the right-hand side, these homologous chromosomes are not pairing up. In fact, all 46 chromosomes separate in from a double-stranded state into a single-stranded state. We then end up with 46 total chromosomes in each one of these cells, and we only create two cells as a result of mitosis. So let's review. Meiosis is a cell division process that occurs in sex cells only. We sometimes call it reduction division, and we have to go through two division processes. Meiosis I separates cyst or homologous chromosomes into separate cells. Meiosis II will then take those double-stranded chromosomes and separate them into single-stranded chromosomes. Now, <clears throat> our goal is to ultimately end up with a haploid set that's 23, right, of single-stranded chromosomes, and we're going to end up with a total of four cells. So the cells that we make are gametes. Those, of course, are sex cells. We have four haploid sperm in males, and in females, we end up making one egg and three junk cells. We'll talk more about why there's a, a slight difference there when we get to the female reproductive physiology video. So now that we've had some background information, now we can head to your course pack on page 129 and talk a little more about spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis. To start off with, sperm production begins at puberty with the onset of an increase in hormone levels. The time to make sperm through both of these processes, spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis, takes about 10 weeks, around 64 to 72 days. Once the sperm is ejaculated, it can live about, uh, say, 72 hours, three or four days at max, um, but most of the time they're going to die off by around 48 hours, so that's about two days. So you've got some extreme long-lived sperm that may be able to survive a little longer. Now, this process of making sperm is twofold. Spermatogenesis involves mitosis and meiosis while spermiogenesis does not involve any cell division, it's simply a process of streamlining a spermatid into a sperm. So let's walk through this process. You're looking at both spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis on this picture. We are gonna start with a, a stem cell called a spermatogonium, and this is in the testes. So I'm gonna put a note up here that we're in the um, there's seminiferous tubules inside the testes, and the spermatogonium is going to divide through mitosis 
and these additional spermatogonia are going to return back to the stem cell line so the process can continue. We're only going to follow one result here, and that's going to be this primary spermatocyte. We took a double-stranded spermatogonium where the homologous chromosomes are paired up. So let's make a note over here. <clears throat> Okay, so in that cell, the homologous chromosomes are paired. You'll notice they are double-stranded, meaning they have been replicated and are ready to undergo cell division. So when we undergo mitosis, we simply produce a clone cell. So we still have homologous chromosomes pairing up here. Now, we're undergoing meiosis one. That's what they call the first meiotic division. And you'll notice that we're gonna separate homologous chromosomes. I'm simply going to write that we're separating homologs. So that means we now have 23 chromosomes in the secondary spermatocytes. But take a really close look. These chromosomes here are still double-stranded, meaning they're still in a replicated state. So we now need to undergo meiosis II, which is our second meiotic division, and that's going to allow for us to separate these double-stranded chromosomes into these single-stranded chromosomes. Now, we are not going to reduce the chromosome count any further. Each one of these resulting cells is going to have 23 chromosomes. So are these resulting spermatids haploid or diploid? They are haploid. All right, so let's make a note here. When we divide those secondary spermatocytes, this time we're separating the sister chromatids. And that means we're taking a double-stranded chromosome that looks like an X, and we're separating it into single-stranded chromosomes, an unreplicated chromosome. Now, I'm gonna draw a line right through here because we have now finished the process of spermatogenesis. So what we've created are spermatids, but you'll notice those spermatids don't look anything like a normal sperm. We now have to undergo a final maturation process called spermiogenesis. And this is where the sperm move to the epididymis and spend about 20 days. Now, we're looking at spermatids being transformed into sperm. So we're gonna streamline the way the cells look. We're gonna reduce the number of uh, cytoplasm in that cell. These cells will grow a mid-piece that are powered by mitochondria. And what's the real name for that tail? It's a flagellum. The head is where the DNA is housed. All right, so all said and done, this entire process of spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis will take around 10 weeks. It takes this long for a sperm to be ready to be ejaculated from the epididymis through the vas deferens and out through the rest of the reproductive pathway. Just for a point of comparison, on the left you'll notice sperm, a sperm production produces four sperm. They are haploid, whereas females produce one ovum, but look how huge that cell is. They say that the ovum in a female's body is the largest cell. In fact, it's barely visible with the naked eye sitting atop a pinhead. Male sperm are the smallest cells in the human body. So when these two get together, we are gonna create a new cell called a zygote that is gonna contain 46 chromosomes. The other cells here, these junk cells called polar bodies, we'll talk more about those when we get into the female reproductive system. Basically, they contribute their cytoplasm and cell cellular machinery to make this one ovum really large. So this process that you're looking at here is spermiogenesis. You've got a really nicely created sperm. The cytoplasm's been lost to streamline the head or DNA region of that sperm. The midpiece is powered by mitochondria. We talked about that. And this tail is a flagellum that allows for swimming. I also wanted to point out this helmet that the sperm is wearing. It's called an acrosome. It does protect the DNA in the head region of the sperm, and it also contains enzymes. Those enzymes will rupture when that sperm cell gets close to an egg cell. 
The enzymes were, are meant to rupture the egg's membrane, helping to break it down so that fertilization may be possible. Just another look here at spermiogenesis, how we transform a spermatid haploid cell into a full-fledged sperm. So when fertilization occurs, that flagellum is broken off from the rest of the cell and left outside the egg. Only the head travels into the uh, egg cell. So basically the flagellum is just jumped once we arrive at the destination, and that of course is the ovum or egg. All right, so if you will flip on over with me, we're gonna take a look at page 130 for just a moment. We are now talking about male sex hormones. This is a great way for us to review some information from the very beginning of this course. You may recall that a hormone called GNRH, or gonadotropic releasing hormone, is made by the hypothalamus. When a boy reaches puberty, levels of GNRH start to increase. That will then carry the message next door to the anterior pituitary to start releasing FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, and LH, luteinizing hormone. Sometimes in males, FSH is called interstitial cell stimulating hormone, or ICSH. Okay, but same hormone. The goal here is that at puberty, we start seeing FSH stimulating, stimulating spermatogenesis in those uh, seminiferous tubules of the testes. LH causes the interstitial cells of the testes to secrete testosterone. So it's at puberty that we see this onset of sex cell production. It never ends. A male can still produce sperm until the very last day of life. I also wanted to mention to you this hormone here called inhibin. It's produced in many locations around a male's and a female's body. It actually will inhibit FSH if levels get too high and lower sperm production. So interesting to note that we maintain sperm production within a narrow range and that if we get too many sperm or too much FSH, inhibin will lower those levels. So it does exactly as its name implies, it inhibits sperm production. We know that testosterone is made in the testes and specifically it's made in those interstitial cells between those seminiferous tubules. And the whole job of testosterone is to produce or help mature sperm, to help grow and develop sex organs, especially when a boy is going through puberty, and then finally to help a male develop secondary sex characteristics such as a deeper voice, male hair patterns on the body, such as axillary hair in the armpits or pubic regions, skin becomes thicker with testosterone, bones will also grow in response to testosterone as well as skeletal muscle. There's other effects of testosterone. This is just a very short list. We know that testosterone increases the blood supply, for instance. So there are things here that are happening with testosterone that females don't see because they lack testosterone. All right, so that should take us through page 130. There's a practice page for you on 131, and then we'll pick up with the female reproductive anatomy and physiology in two separate videos.